all across Europe for over 400 years in many different cultures. One weapon was prolific on the battlefield. The Bardiche was primarily used between the 14th and 17th century. However, there's some medieval artwork that dated back to 1250 and possibly earlier. In the 17th century, the Strutzi took the Bardiche to another level, pairing it with a long gun and arming a massive number of Russian infantry. The giant battle axe dominates modern fantasy artwork. But make no mistake, the Bardiche is not only one of the largest axes ever made in history, but it's also the most heavily produced axe throughout all of Europe. There is perhaps no greater way of gaining a better understanding of a historical weapon such as this than by simply making one. So join us today as we bring to you the making of a 17th century Bardiche. The image of a very large war axe is very prominent in popular culture and media as well as comic books, video games, so on and so forth. It would look something like this. This is fairly familiar to you. Now, as a war axe, this is way too large. However, it is fairly impressive. And most historical war axes were very, very tiny, with the exception of the item we're going to be making today. The body of our axe is going to be made out of wrought iron. Wrought iron is known to have many impurities, so it will have to be folded several times before it becomes usable material. Now, I introduce to you the 17th century Bardiche. The history of the Bardiche starts out around the 1400s and continues all the way through the 17th century, although the early examples can only technically be called Bardiche, and they vary quite a bit. However, by the end of the 16th century, and especially in the 17th century, in Eastern Europe, the Bardiche became a standard issue weapon. It would be a complementary weapon for the riflemen or strelitsi brigades and would be made by the thousands. I say complementary weapon because from the name you can immediately realize that the primary weapon would have been the firearm, uh, at that time a matchlock. In Eastern Europe they would be very often not even made locally but imported from uh, the Dutch, uh, the Italians, the Germans, so on and so forth as rifle technology was quite a little bit better than in the home country. With our high carbon edge insert now forged and our wrought iron now consolidated, it's time to begin prepping both pieces for the forge well. The Bardiche can be roughly classified into two types. The first type is a slightly smaller one in general, but is characterized by the flare at the tip. Now, that Bardiche is not the one we're going to be making, because the second one is a little bit more interesting to me personally, and that one is characterized by the crescent shape of the blade. Very often, the blade length of those Bardiche exceeds or varies around 90 centimeters. Uh, for you who are not uh, knowledgeable in uh, metric, you can convert it very easily. 90 centimeters is already a respectable length for a sword blade that transitions a sword into already a hand and a half sword. One thing to note, and the most interesting part about the Bardiche, that they are not nice weapons. In fact, uh, I can recall only uh, four examples of extravagant Bardiche uh, with piercing, etching, gilding, so on and so forth, but the rest are quite plain, and that is of a historical interest. See, unlike parade armor that is generally made for show and uh, special events, the historical items that were used in war 
would be made within the confines of very, very economic choices. Every single one of them has to match a set of criteria. Uh, cheapness of production, meaning how many you can produce at a given rate, standardization and their effectiveness on the battlefield. The effectiveness of the battlefield goes to the point of how well your troops perform. And the cheapness of production goes into how many troops you can arm, and the more troops you can arm and the better they perform, already determines the nature of warfare. The blade portion and the eye of the axe are forged separately, so we must finish the prep work on the blade side so that when Ilya forges the eye, they can be forge welded as one. Here the Bardish has a very special place in Eastern Europe. As I mentioned, the Strelci or the Shooter Brigades, which are very infamous or famous in the history of Eastern Europe and participate in many, many, many uprisings as well as uh, battles proper. Uh, you see, the Bardish is not a weapon in its own right, knowing what we know about how the stock was designed. Uh, the stock was designed from a very utilitarian standpoint. It is most often octagonal shape. So, meaning you take a plane and it's done. Right? Now, the stock has several features that incorporate a sling. A sling is a belt uh, made out of leather or uh, some sort of fabric that allows you to carry the Bardiche over your shoulder while you're employing uh, your firearm. However, the length of the haft of the Bardiche is very well known and is actually in military manuals and converting from old measuring system to new ones, modern ones, they are 1.5 meters exactly, no matter what type of Bardiche it is. Now, the prescribed length, which tends to be shorter for a polearm, uh, unlike a halberd, which is way long, the Bardish lands around here, right? Why would that be? Well, let's look at the features of the stock, uh, the features of the Bardish, and keeping in mind what sort of troop it lands in the hands of. Now, uh, there is a very common theory that the Bardish would be used as a rifle rest. And judging from the features of the stock, its length, and the way the Bardish operates in the hands, as well as the terrains that people would confront armies, that is a very likely theory, in the sense that you land the Bardish in the ground, because most of them have a very haphazard uh, spear-like tip at the bottom that you stick in the ground or between cobblestones, and you place your firearm on top of it, waiting for the command to shoot. Once you shot, you have to grab the firearm, sling the Bardiche over your shoulder and step back so that the next person who is already loaded can take position. See, if this weapon would not have had a sling, what happens is you're losing precious minutes. So imagine an army uh, or a battalion of around 2,000 people or more or more or more and uh, start adding those precious half a second that it takes to carry a slinged weapon as opposed to an unslinged weapon, and let's say half a second times 20,000. How many precious minutes as a result it costs to just move the troops around? We're dealing with a game of statistics at this point, so the presence of a sling and the function of the Bardiche as a rifle stand becomes what is known as a force multiplier. So, by itself, it might be a trivial change for the individual. But remember, no battle was won by individual warriors swinging a brave sword in battle. What happens is the uh, battle is won by a troop who has standardized equipment, and there's a lot of those troops, and they each perform the one single boring function. And that is called tactics. With the eye now forge welded to the body of the axe and the preform complete, it's time to begin forging in the bevels of our axe. The way the quite long Bardiche blade is attached to the haft is fairly specific. Not only we have the classic eye of an axe, we also have the bottom tang of flange, in our case it's going to be a flange, that is also nailed in to the haft and then wound with leather or cord.
doing your best to recreate historical items, it's important to note that forging the item 99% of the way to shape is the only way to truly test the results. We use the grinder just to speed up the process a little bit. This could have easily been touched up with a file and been ready for entry. The vast majority of British blades have a series of holes drilled or punched on the back of the blade. Now we're not quite certain what these holes were for and if someone can inform me in the comments below, please do so. I've only seen one example with a set of rings, kind of like a stereotypical Chinese sword on the back of a British, but I don't know how authentic those rings are to that specific blade. One theory can be that it can hold a braided in wick that is always lit and is useful for lighting a matchlock. And another theory is, is to remove some weight off of it, although they're known for being fairly heavy weapons to begin with, so removing a couple grams doesn't seem to be a plausible theory. As I said, the Bardiche is not a nice weapon. Uh, in fact, looking at the axe blades of the Bardiche, we can tell that they were fairly roughly forged out, uh, not fully professionally polished, as you can often see the leftover dings of the hammer in them, and most likely they would have been made out of iron, although some examples that I studied have clearly some other sort of material forge welded to be the edge. Now, it is up to debate whether they were heat treated or not. We're going to heat treat ours, however, that is probably not the case for the vast majority of the examples of the weapon. The reason being is uh, humans are very soft, so a piece of sharpened iron performs just as well as a piece of sharpened good steel, especially when you're dealing with armies of several thousands of people. Now, if you're heat treating a blade, let's say you have an order of 1,000 items, right? And 1,000 of those items have to be delivered on time and on budget. Heat treating inherently produces a risk of failure, let's say uh, 5%. So out of 1,000 of those items on delivery, 50 will be bad. So you under deliver 50. That means 50 soldiers don't get to be equipped this specific month, uh, and that means there's a loss to the military apparatus. And looking at the British, the way it was forge welded from many pieces of iron, how haphazard it was, indicates that we have a rich history of appropriations contracts. We probably, with studying enough examples, can tell which factors were making how many, and looking at the haphazard nature that I mentioned before, we can immediately determine which features were important from the standpoint of military tactics, uh, orders that came into a given factory, and which features were practical. So anything that is not present on the Bardiche, but you would expect to be present, like if you like nice uh, weapons, means that those things were detrimental to the overall function of the weapon as a part of the standard issue armament in a given standardized unit. For the vast majority of Bardiche blades, the polish seems to be haphazard or lacking, and an equivalent of rubbing some uh, brick dust on the surface so that in the morning you pass inspection.
We're going to polish and etch ours so that you, the viewer, can see how the metal pieces are assembled together and enjoy it, quite frankly. But the historical examples will most certainly not etched to expose the structure of the iron or steel. As I said before, the hats are most often octagonal, uh, so the equivalent of using a plane on one side, the other side, and it's done. Meaning, the choices made were for the most effective manufacturing of as many as you can. overlooked features of the Berdish is the lower mounting point, the swivel, for the sleigh. Uh, in the extant hafts we see a sometimes somewhat artistic protrusion where what I suspect a U-shaped nail was hammered in to allow for the sling for the belt to be attached. With the head of the bardiche now mounted, it's time to begin making the sling for our polearm. Because the bardiche was a standard issue weapon and not tailored individually for a combatant, the belt had to be adjusted.
Thanks for watching our historical presentation of the 17th century Bardiche. Be sure to give this video a like if you enjoyed it and tell us in the comments below what build you'd like to see us do next. And as always, please consider subscribing to our channel. That works.